Picking the right camera for astrophotography is surprisingly difficult, as you both need to make sure it actually matches the optics in your telescope. And depending on what target you're shooting at, you need different cameras with different specs. And in this video, I'm gonna break it all down for you so that you can make an informed decision when you are buying your Astro camera. So as I said, there are different specs on the cameras that we're looking for depending on the different targets. And if we're gonna start with deep sky objects, Deep Sky Optics is an exercise in extremely poor signal to noise. These objects are relatively large in the night sky, often like visibly larger than the moon, have a larger angular size than the moon, some of them, but they will often be very, very faint. So that means we just need to collect a lot of light over a long period of time in order to take pictures of these deep sky objects. And that's gonna be important when we are picking the camera because we need to find a camera that is well suited to that kind of job. The first thing you need to do when you're picking a camera is you need to look at the telescope you're going to attach it to. Telescopes have what's called a image circle. That's essentially just how big of an area um, can the telescope light up on a chip? How much, how big of a circle can it, can it put the light on? And the closer you get to the edge of that image circle, the fainter the light's gonna be, so the darker it's going to be. So you wanna make sure that you pick a camera chip um, or a camera with a, with a sensor size that is as large as possible without getting too close to the edge. Okay, once we found a sensor size that kind of matches the telescope, now we need to talk about what's called quantum efficiency. Now the quantum efficiency is essentially just for each photon of light that hits a, a pixel or the sensor in general, how big a percentage of those are then converted into data, okay? So it's not 100% efficient. No cameras is gonna be 100% efficient. A good camera, you will often find 90 plus percent. Often, not always, but in many cases, you will find that monochrome cameras have a higher quantum efficiency um, than the color cameras, simply because there's these layers between the, the, the Bayer patterns that filters out some of the light. But in general, the, um, the monochromes have a tendency to have a slightly better um, uh, quantum efficiency. But again, find anything with like 90 plus and you should be okay. Now we know bigger sensor means more light, more light gets converted into, uh, into data, we have a higher quantum efficiency, and now that data is gonna be put in storage, if you will, on the sensor while the sensor is taking, uh, taking its picture. And, it is, and now we need to talk about what's called the full well depth. The full well depth is essentially how many converted photons can each pixel hold? So that means, let's say you have a full world depth of um, 36,000, could be a, a number you would see on a camera. That means that each pixel can hold up to 36,000 converted photons over to energy. Is that a lot? The higher it is, the bigger dynamic range you will get. That basically means the higher, the more like data each, more electrons each sensor well can store, the more data you can collect before the sensor peaks and you begin to overexpose. So that again can be important if you want to, to try and avoid having your sensor or your, your stars get completely blown out while collecting data on the um, um, on, on a very, very faint um, nebula maybe. Um, this can also dictate how long exposures you can do with that camera because again, the longer you expose, those stars is gonna to begin to be, um, to be overexposed and you wanna to try to avoid that. So now that we've collected the data, it's on the chip. Now we need to talk about read noise because when you are reading the data off the chip, then there is generated noise and that's often also measured in, in, in electrons. Again, lower read noise is better because that means you get less noise added to your image by reading it. This is not the end of the world if the read noise is slightly higher because we can measure it with our bias frames. So we take our biases, that's the best sense of you reading, um, measuring the read noise, and then when you put it into your stacking software, it will do a mathematical model of what your noise looks like, and then it will subtract it so you can remove a lot of the read noise from the camera. Next, we talk about the um, like the bit depth, I guess, of, of the sensor or the camera. Sometimes you will see them being listed as being a 12-bit camera or 14-bit camera or whatever. This is essentially just when it is the, when the camera is reading those electron counts out of each individual pixel, it's being stored in a binary number. And the longer that binary number is, the more fine-grained it's going to be able to read it. So higher 
bit cameras mean it's more, it can divide that more fine, divide your counter data more finely than a lower bit rate camera, or a bit rate bit camera. And of course, you also need to consider whether you want a cooled or a non cooled camera. Cool cameras, of course, means that the sensor is being cooled down to a very low temperature, often below freezing, um, and that just reduces the noise that uh, that is built up on the sensor over time because you also have, I think people refer to it as dark current, this basically just noise that, that builds up on the sensor that is not data coming in from light, but just builds up over time. But of course, as all these stats improve with the camera, price also goes up. But at least now you know if you're looking at two cameras that may have the same resolution and the same sensor size, why one can be more expensive than the other, because it might have a higher quality sensor with better quantum efficiency. So at least now you know what it is you're buying. Now, when it comes to planetary cameras, it's a completely different ballgame. Because where before we were looking at relatively large objects that's very faint, now we're looking at very tiny objects that is very, very bright. So all of a sudden, all this we talked about, about read noise and reducing all that, becomes less important when we're looking at a planetary camera because what we're looking at now is actually to be able to resolve a small but bright object. That also means because the object is small, well, we are actually looking to have as small pixels as possible because we want across the, the surface of the planet we're taking a picture of, could be Jupiter, we want as many pixels as possible so that we get the highest resolution um, image of the planet itself. And often these things are so small that it's actually preferred to have smaller sensors because you don't need a big sensor as these things are tiny, tiny, tiny objects in the night sky. Now for deep space, as I said, you have mono, you have color. Some people prefer one over the other. For planetary, I think most people go with color cameras. Now I said that you just want as small pixels as possible and that's not technically true. In a previous video, I talk about what's called the Rayleigh limits, which is the limit for how small of a object a single tel a telescope can resolve. Um, if you haven't watched it, I'm going to link it at the end of the video, so you can go and click it there if, uh, if you're interested. If your pixels are significantly smaller than the Rayleigh limit of your telescope, you're going to do what's called oversampling. And if you're oversampling, your pixels are just so small that you're not really gathering more information because the telescope can't resolve things so small on the scale of your pixels. So essentially, you're just wasting buying expensive, very small planetary cameras. What I often do is I would take, I would go into Telescopius, wonderful site. I'll go and I'll plug in my, my different telescopes. And then in the telescope simulator, it actually lists the ray length limit. Now, what you're aiming for here is that the size of your pixels their angular size on the night sky should be around half the size of your um, railing limit. You should not go lower than that. If you go lower than that, you're beginning to significantly oversample. Technically, if you go on to half, we are still oversampling, but there is still a little bit to gain to go slightly lower than the railing limit. So, but I wouldn't recommend you go much lower than half the railing limit. I was actually recently looking for a new camera for planetary photography, as so I want to try to get into that as well. And I was looking at a camera that looks good, tiny, tiny pixels, it's awesome. Until I began looking at the rating limit, then I saw that I was like massively oversampling with that camera. So now I would go and look for a camera that has slightly bigger pixels. Now, one of the things that of course is important when it comes to these kind of things is the frame rate. Because what we are doing when we're taking planetary images is often using a technique called lucky imaging, where you are just taking a lot of pictures very, very fast, um, often called a video, and, and then you just let us uh, a program pick out maybe the top 10% best frames, and then it uses that for stacking and just rejects all the others simply because of atmospheric noise. A lot of time, the cameras will have a frames per second um, listed on it. And while that is important, um, I wouldn't just take it and go for the highest FPS either, because what you can do with some of these dedicated softwares that you use for it is we can actually crop the sensor before you take the picture. So we can actually say, hey, disregard large part of the sensor, only take this small sensor square. And if you do so, that means you can actually increase the frames per second beyond what is probably listed on the camera, because what's listed on the camera is, of course, the frames per second if you take the entire frame. But as you crop it down, you can increase the frame rate. I really hope you found this video useful. Please consider subscribing, dropping a like, maybe give a comment if you have a good idea for a future video. 
And if you want to help me, then you can either go check out my book, The uh, Cosmic Field Guy, um, on deepspacebooks.com, or you can also consider becoming a channel member where there is some perks and you can find all the information about this below the video. Really, really straightforward. Here we have the angle theta. That's the angle between the two stars. We have, if we start up here at the top, we will of course see the saddle. The saddle itself is full metal. We can see that it has a dual saddle, so it can take both 